Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 156th uh, regular period of sessions at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This is hearing number 53, entitled Reports of Excessive Use of Force by the Police Against People of African Descent in the United States. I am Rosemary Antoine, President of the Commission. Uh, I am also the Rapporteur for Persons of African Descent and Against Discrimination. Uh, and with me on my right, I have Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, who is the Country Rapporteur for the United States and the Rapporteur for the Rights of uh, Migrants. And to my left, I have Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz, who is the Rapporteur for the Rights of Children. I want to welcome all of you uh, to this hearing today. Uh, I, the State of the United States, who have a few hearings today, and once again to express my deep appreciation to the United States and their commitment to these hearings, attending in good faith uh, several hearings uh, in the spirit of dialogue, and a special warm welcome to those who requested the hearing, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights and St. Louis Uni Uni University School of Law. Uh, I don't have a list of participants, but I see five of you, so you will no doubt introduce yourselves. We are very interested in this subject. Uh, it is not only topical, but one that the Commission is working on actively. Each of you will have 20 minutes to speak in the first instance after which we will ask a few questions, make a few comments, and hopefully have another, op another opportunity for feedback. So please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for convening today's hearing on excessive use of force by police against black Americans in the United States. I'm Carrie Kennedy, and it is my honor to introduce my colleagues and the pressing issues we are all here to discuss this morning. To my right, I am joined by Martinez Sutton, Sarah Mokuria, uh, Colette Flanagan of Mothers Against P Police Brutality, and Justin Hansford, a professor at St. Louis University School of Law. Racial discrimination has a seat at the table in virtually every aspect of American life, from who gets access to prenatal care to who goes to which school, what they are taught and by whom, who gets disciplined and who does not, who is accepted to college and who is awarded a scholarship, who gets the job offer, how much they are paid, who gets the raise, and who gets fired during first layoffs. It is a seat at the table when a young couple applies for a loan and when an elderly couple needs access to health care. Fifty years after the Voting Rights Act was signed into law, race has a place at the table when deciding who gets the easy access to voter registration and who does not. So it is no surprise that racial discrimination seems seated at the head of the table in our criminal justice system. African Americans comprise only 13 percent of the U.S. population and 14 percent of the monthly drug users but are 37% of those arrested for drug-related offenses. In New York City, 80% of the stop and frisk police made were against blacks and Latinos compared with only 8% of whites. After being arrested, African Americans are 33% more likely than whites to, to be detained while facing a felony charge in New York. In 2010, the U.S. Sentencing Commission reported that African Americans received 10 percent longer sentences than whites for the same crimes, and African Americans are 20 percent more likely to be sentenced to prison than white drug offenders. Discrimination against black Americans runs as deep as our nation's origins that were rooted in slavery and still manifest in especially harmful ways, particularly within our criminal justice system that is still reeling after being used for centuries to oppress black communities. In this context, it is sadly unsurprising that our justice system, that is filled with well-meaning and courageous Americans who believe in the founding principles of justice for all, is a system that still excludes, suppresses, 
disadvantages and even kills black Americans at an alarmingly disproportionate rate. It is against this backdrop that we are here today to discuss one such symptom of this phenomenon, the vastly disproportionate killings of black Americans, many of them unarmed by police in our country. Although just 13.2% of our country's population is black, more than 34% of the unarmed civilians killed by officers in 2015 were African American. Despite this widespread problem, investigations of police killings and excessive use of force rarely result in prosecution or legal accountability. This institutional failure is a central part of the cycle of violence and discrimination against people of color generally and black Americans in particular by police in our country. It is now my honor to introduce Martina Sutton. Good afternoon. My name is Martina Sutton. On March 21st, 2012, my sister Rekia Boy was out enjoying herself on the west side of Chicago in Douglas Park. She called me and let me know that she wasn't coming home that night. I didn't know that she meant she was going to be gone forever. It was around 100 people in the park that night. Rekia and three other friends left the park and decided to walk to the store, one block west of where they originally were. En route, they came across a black Mercedes Benz coming out the alley that they were about to cross. The vehicle stopped in the alley, and the occupant, who was later known as off-duty officer Dante Servin, exchanged words with the group, which was established as being non-threatening. As Dante Servin made a left, which was heading east out of the alley, which was a one-way street heading west, he stopped his vehicle about five feet, five feet from the alley. One of the males in the group, Antonio Cross, turned and yelled, what do you want? I told you we don't have no drugs. As soon as he finished his sentence, service extended his arm out of the window and started firing his handgun. He stepped out of the vehicle and continued firing. The end results being Antonio Cross was shot in his hand while my sister Rekia Boy was shot in the back of her head. The reason why Rekia is dead because he didn't like the noise that was coming out of the park. Dante Servin stayed across the street, directly across the street from the park. It was deemed to justify shooting, but they had nothing to justify it with. There was no weapon found, no weapon on any person in the group, no, per no weapon on any person in the group, nor was anyone in the group being confrontational. So where's the justification? I met Dante face to face a few months later, and he showed me how he killed my sister and asked me, what do I want to happen? I told him I wanted him to go down for what he did, and he expressed the best thing for me to do is to sue the city, take money, and take care of my family and leave well enough alone. When I let him know I thought otherwise, he stated, okay, if this is what you want, it's like he knew he would have gotten off. Trial was set for April 2015 which lasted about two to three and a half weeks. On April 20th, 2015, George Porter ruled not guilty to, due to the charges that were put against Servin. The prosecutors charged Servin with a voluntary manslaughter. Judge Porter declared the charges shouldn't have been anything but murder. He stated the prosecutors have failed to provide the right charges. The pain that I feel in my heart will never be healed because of the psychological trauma that plays in my head on a constant basis. There was no help offered to help soothe the pain that me and my family feels. No mental health services offered, not even an apology for taking my sister off this earth. The constant harassment I received from police officers for speaking up about the loss hasn't died down yet. At times I feel like I am the next to die and it can happen to me at any given moment. The pain in my, uh, my mother's eyes, along with the constant flow of tears that fall down her face, is never ending. How can I dry up a river of tears with Kleenex? Explain it to my children, my nieces, my nephews that they honest never coming home is tough, especially the youngest ones that always expect for her to walk through that door. In the search for answers, I've just been presented with more problems that seem to have no solutions. I was taught as a youth to never hit or disrespect a woman. My sister was hit in the back of the head and disrespected for being an innocent victim. What is this world coming to? 
If we continue to look past the presence of our women, our future will cease to exist. I'm still trying to find justice, but then I'm finding out that what is justice? To me, it's just ice to numb the situation. <sighs> That's it. That's it. I'm still trying to find answers, and I'm hoping that y'all can help me with them. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Colette Flanagan. I'm the founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. My son, my only son, Clinton Allen, was murdered by a Dallas policeman on March 10th, 2013. Clinton was unarmed. He was shot seven times, once under his left arm, consistent with his hands being raised, five times in the chest, and once at close range in the back. The policeman that killed my son did exactly what his past behavior indicated he would do. He had a record of falsifying police records, running over a fleeing suspect with his squad car, and using excessive force on people he came in contact with, mostly black men. And finally, on that fateful day, he graduated to killing and he killed my son. When you lose a child, it is the most devastating event that will occur or could ever occur in your lifetime. But when you lose a child to police violence, it breaks the social contract, destroying your everyday understanding and beliefs in your country. The level of betrayal is so awful that it literally changes your DNA. Losing a child to police violence renders you helpless and hopeless. Your will to live is taken away, and at that point, you fight every day just to exist. Your quality of life is diminished, and your health is compromised, as mine was. I had just finished battling breast cancer less than a year before Clinton was taken from us so egregiously and violently. I had chosen the most radical and aggressive treatment to combat my cancer because I wanted to be here for my children. My greatest fear was never losing one of my children. No, my greatest fear had always been them losing me and trying to navigate in this world without me, without their mother. I share this with you because I want you to understand that when our children are unjustly killed by police, because of the color of their skin, the turmoil that our families endure, often while dealing with illnesses, financial issues, not being able to bury our children, no health insurance because you can no longer work from the raw stress of such a loss. Losing a child to police violence not only affects the mother, but other family members as well. It's like a powerful tsunami that blows your family to bits. Clinton's father was physically the strongest man that I ever knew. And Clinton's death has reduced him to half the man mentally and physically he once was. Clinton's grandmother literally died from a broken heart. Dorothy Allen was only 69 years old when her heart gave out last year, and it was determined that she probably had a series of silent heart attacks and the aftermath of Clinton's death. Can you imagine being told that you would just have to live with the fact that your child is gone and no one is going to help you obtain justice because his murderer is a police officer? That is what I was told. And many other mothers in Dallas have been told the same thing. In Dallas, the last time a policeman was indicted for shooting and killing an unarmed, a mentally ill person was when President Nixon was president. That is 42 years ago. And this despite hundreds 
of police shootings. The policeman that killed my son was not fit to be a policeman. He had such a troubled history with the Dallas Police Department. We insisted and prevailed that he not only not be allowed to, to go back on patrol with a gun, but he has received no other punishment. No charges, no indictment, no trial, and no loss of pay. I take courage from mothers like Virginia Brad Bradford, my friend in Dallas, whose son, Fred, was riding his bicycle to work just one month after Clinton was killed. When a police car pulled up beside him, the white officer demanded, nigger, where are you going? Is it any wonder we insist that black lives matter? Fred Bradford, fearing for his life, that day, two years ago in Dallas, didn't stop pedaling. The officer ran over him completely. He backed up and he ran over Fred again, breaking every single bone in his body. We only know this because Fred lingered in agony for 30 days in the hospital before he died. And he was able to tell us what happened. The policeman that killed Fred was indicted but he is unlikely to ever see the inside of a prison. Fred's mother, Virginia, didn't know what had happened to her son for two full days. They kept it from her. If Fred had died, we would have never, ever known the truth. And this killer cop could still have his job, his badge, his squad car, and his gun. And undoubtedly, he would have killed again. I offer you today the testimony of Virginia Brad Bradford and that of other mothers and family members who lost their children to police violence. Grief and struggle, this is what America has left us. My own sorrow turned to anger at the pervasive injustice and finally to determination to win justice for my son the homicidal brutality of police officers is an ongoing national disgrace. I am determined to win justice for my son and for others whose lives and futures have been stolen by the very officials who are sworn to protect and serve us. But I need the help of this commission to hold my country to their commitment to respect human rights. Mothers Against Police Brutality needs your help to restore the social contract that police violence has ripped to shreds in the streets of our cities. I pray that we will reweave the social contract before more lives are lost. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Sarah Mokuria. And I want to start by telling you a little bit about my father, Tesfai Mokuria. He was, a, he was a nurturer. He was the type of man who, if he found an animal that was injured on the street, or if he saw a person who was hungry, he would bring them to our home for food. My father was also a gardener. This is something that one of his clients wrote to my mother. I cannot tell you how shocked and dismayed I was upon reading the newspaper account of Tesfai's passing. I cannot think of a single time that I ever saw him upset, much less angry or hostile. I do not think that I will ever be able to make sense of this. If I had to characterize Tesfai in one word, it would be gentleman, with an emphasis on gentle. Another word would be generous. I do not ever remember meeting someone so devoid of greed. I cannot go into my own backyard are now without thinking of him. Now it is painful, but hopefully in the future it will become comforting. He was still my friend. He is and still was my friend. My father didn't pass away. He was killed. He was killed by Dallas police, two officers who are still on the Dallas police force in front of me and my mom and my one-year-old sister in our family home. I was 10 years old as I watched his body collapse, riddled with bullets. I was standing behind him. I watched as the blood bubbles from his mouth, as my mom, who was holding my one-year-old sister in one hand, gripped 
my father's foot with his other hand, her other hand and wailed and cried. I, in my childhood innocence, asked the officer to call 911 to help him. I was then instructed by the officer to t change out of my pajamas and into clothes, and I was put into a police officer's car and was told that I wasn't going to be able to see my mother until I made a statement. I wasn't reunited with my mother and my sister for hours. My mother fought for two years to get my, myself and my sister considered crimes eligible for counseling services through crime victims compensation. My mother's friends cleaned up my father's blood and repaired the carpets in our home because most people don't know that grief stricken families are the ones not only left to identify lifeless bodies of their loved ones but also to clean up the, the blood splattered throughout the crime scenes of, um, of our families. I can't begin to explain how this trauma has impacted my family and my life. It literally shaped me, the woman that I am. I jump, I jump at loud noises. When people walk up on me too fast, it, it scares me. Most people, uh, family and friends, think that this is entertaining, but it's a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. This type of trauma has affected everything from my memory to my physical health. The physical, emotional, financial, and social impact on families are immeasurable. The trauma ripples throughout the entire community. I'm a co-founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality with Colette Flanagan. And um, in our work, we've interviewed over 500 black Americans in Dallas, Texas, to find out how alienated people feel from, uh, in their communities from the police. And I'd like to share some of those results. Our survey found that only 12% of respondents in Dallas felt a great deal of respect for police. One in three say they have hardly any respect for the police and do not feel comfortable calling the police when they have a problem. More than half of over 500 respondents said that they personally felt threatened or treated unfairly by police officers. Two out of three people we surveyed stated that a police officer has spoken rudely to them or a family member. In other words, two out of three encounters involved verbal abuse by a police officer. More than one third of the respondents said that they or family members had been physically roughed up by a police officer, specifically shoved, grabbed, hit, choked, or held in a painful way. These results highlight the lack of confidence that exists in police in this country. We need a transformation of policing in this country. Police should not be held above the law. All three of the officers that, well, there are four officers, and two in my, in my case, have not been held accountable. When, a police of, when police officers are given immunity, it creates a culture that breeds more violence. Training of our police officers should be ongoing and comprehensive. When excessive or deadly force is used by police officers, they should be drug tested immediately and independently investigated and prosecuted. All fam family members should not have to fight, but should have access to crime victims' compensation. Data reporting from police departments should not be voluntary. It should be mandatory and analyzed independently. And our city, uh, which is hailed as one of the most progressive ones in, in reporting of data, does not release raw data, it, re it releases graphs and tables. So if Eric Garner, who was choked to death in New York City, had died in Dallas, his death would not be reported in, the, in what's released by the Dallas Police Department. Fred Bradford is also not part of that data. We do not have time for gradual changes. We, the family members of those killed by police, represent a level of experience which America tries to hide and deny. I pray that this hearing contributes to the necessary and urgent change this country needs. The United States asks us to assume that these systematic extrajudicial killings result from a long-running mishap or the simple failure of attempts at color, colorblind criminal justice. But today I'm going to ask you, Commission, to shift your lens 
In general, the discriminatory laws on policing and cr criminal justice are holdovers drafted by state lawmakers who may be a few years earlier drafted Jim Crow poll tax laws as a way to ensure white domination through pretext. What if our criminal justice problems are not as unintentional as a few bad apples here and there, but as intentional as policy choices? What if the system is not inefficient or in need of reform, but working exactly as it was designed to work? Consider racial profiling. Under the International Covenant to End Racial Discrimination, state, local, and federal government must avoid promoting de jure or de facto discrimination, even when no intent can be proven. Broken windows policing, uh, reframed as community policing, policing often uh, by the 21st Century Policing Task Force, for example, often targets black and Latino communities for more police contact, even if it's through a non-racial pretext. When blacks are arrested and jailed at grossly disproportionate rates, because of this targeting, they are seen as stereotypic stereotypically criminals. The narrative of black criminality created by racial profiling ends in the results that you see here with more profiling and more excessive use of force. Currently, not a single state law of excessive force complies with international human rights standards. The UN Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials and the UN Basic Principles on the Use of Force and Firearms by Law Enforcement Officials require police to minimize damage and respect and preserve human life and dignity. Instead, the U.S. constitutional standard laid out by the Supreme Court in Tennessee v. Garner contemplates the shooting and killing of fleeing suspects, a reasonableness standard in the use of force that emphasizes a police officer's own often unreasonable and non-genuine expression of his feeling of personal fear and the common use of humiliation as a tactic. Often they will simply yell, stop resisting, even without cause, and use that as a basis for savage violence, even against human rights defenders. The culture of impunity created by these laws lies at the heart of all the heart-rending stories you heard earlier uh, a few minutes ago. Both criminal proceedings and internal reviews are plagued by unreliable police testimony, unenthusiastic prosecutors, limited evidence due to the influence of police unions, and secrecy and violation of the principles of independence and impartiality under international law. The United States, in its policing task force final report, acknowledges the past role of policing in racial subordination. That acknowledgement must be followed by reparation and not a reform of racialized policing, but in a, a complete, total abolishment of it. At some point, we will have to muster the courage as a society to demand more than simply asking to retrain the monster or set up a review board for the monster or put a body camera on the monster. Eventually, global civil society will have to defang this monster and put it to sleep once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, distinguished commissioners, members of the commission, representatives of civil society, and family members. My name is Mike Fitzpatrick from the U.S. Department of State. I am the U.S. Interim Permanent Representative of the United States to the Organization of American States, and I welcome you to <coughs> excuse me. I welcome you to Washington this morning for this very important discussion under the auspices of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. It is an honor, and indeed, I'm humbled to be a part of the U.S. delegation and share some of the highlights of the United States' efforts to eliminate racial discrimination and uphold our human rights obligations and commitments. We thank the Commission for convening this very important thematic discussion today. If I may, we are also particularly pleased that Rose Marie Bellantoine, the Rapporteur on the Rights of Afro-Descendants and Against Racial Discrimination, is not just present, but our chair today. We take this opportunity to thank you, Madam Chair, for your work addressing these issues during your tenure with the Commission, since we know this will be your final period of sessions as a Commissioner for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The United States strongly supports the work of the Inter-American Commission 
to promote human rights in our hemisphere. We acknowledge the positive impact the Commission has had on the laws and practices in many countries and lives of innumerable individuals in our hemisphere, including in our own United States. We are pleased to have been able to facilitate the Commission's site visits on, this, on these particular issues in September to the states of Florida, Louisiana, and Missouri. We hope you, the Commission, found the information and meetings helpful to your interest in this topic. The State Department and the United States Government facilitated these visits in the interest of transparency and cooperation. We hope this will be an example to other OAS member states that no country should shy away from engagement on even the most difficult human rights issues. For today, the United States plans to update the Commission on our efforts to address race and the criminal justice system in the United States generally, efforts we last spoke about at the hearing in March of this year. To this end, I would note that while the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has focused on a number of issues at the state and local level, the officials today here represented with me rep represent the United States federal government. Commissioners, colleagues, and families, the United States understands that there are very real issues with what is taking place in the United States today on these issues, and we are taking steps to address them constructively and consistent with our human rights obligations and commitments. I thank you all for your presence today, for your words, and for sharing your pain, sorrow, and anger with us today. May it help motivate us all in our nation's search for justice for all our citizens. Representing the United States today, first we have Zakia Carr Johnson, Director of the Race, Ethnicity, and Social Inclusion Unit at the United States Department of State. And from the Department of Justice, Deborah L. Spence, Research and Development Division, Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. And with that, I turn the floor over to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Good morning. The Department of State is committed to advancing social and economic inclusion throughout the region. In the Western Hemisphere in particular, the Americas, we understand that failure to pursue social inclusion, inclusive economic growth, and racial equality are serious barriers to any type of sustainable growth. In 2010, we established the Race, Ethnicity, and Social Inclusion Unit in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs to work with our embassies and consulates throughout the region to engage historically marginalized groups and address the underlying causes of inequality by improving access to justice, services, and economic opportunities. Through action plans with, the, with Brazil and Colombia on racial and ethnic equality, the department supports ongoing dialogue and coordination between our respective governments with civil society on issues like educational exchange and youth leadership and development, but also on very difficult issues like racial profiling, human rights training for law enforcement at all levels of responsibility, and sharing law enforcement models that work with community to resolve conflict. Last year, we also signed an MOU on racial and ethnic equality and social inclusion with Uruguay. In 2013, the U.S. joined consensus on the U.N. General Assembly's resolution to create an international decade for people of African descent beginning this year, from 2015 to 2024. The resolution provides a framework for the United Nations, member states, and civil society to implement activities that promote recognition, justice, and development for persons of African descent. In the United States, the international decade allows us to reflect on accomplishments that we've made as a country, as well as remaining challenges. In a year where we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Voting Rights Act, we also recognize difficulties we still face in cities all across the country, including in Baltimore, Ferguson, New York, Chicago, and Dallas. Initiatives like My Brother's Keeper, uh, through initiatives like My Brother's Keeper, the administration is joining with cities, businesses, and foundations to connect young people with mentoring and skills to eliminate persistent opportunity gaps faced by boys and young men of color. And while we're working to address issues impacting people of African descent who are men, 
We recognize the need to do more to provide full opportunity and equality for black women and girls in the United States today. We're investing in getting more girls, and particularly girls of color, interested in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, and in helping many more of them stay in school and on track. We are aware that combating racism and discrimination is not just a domestic issue. It is a challenge facing every nation and a challenge we can all work together to overcome. As President Obama highlighted at the Summit of the Americas in Panama, we continue to speak out on these issues not because we're interested in meddling, but because we know from our own history that we must stand up for what's right. It's precisely because we are imperfect that we believe this is necessary. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Deborah Spence, and uh, as was said, I currently serve in the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services within the Justice Department. It's most commonly known as the COPS Office. I had the opportunity to speak to this commission earlier this year, and it is a pleasure to be back today. At that hearing, I spoke about the interim report of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. If you recall, that task force was established by an executive order to examine a broad range of issues facing contemporary policing and to identify the best practices and otherwise make recommendations to the president on how to promote effective crime reduction while building public trust. In a democratic society, trust between law enforcement agencies and the people they protect and serve is essential to the stability of communities and the integrity of our criminal justice system. The fear of oppression and discriminatory law enforcement is as debilitating to a community as the fear of crime. The 11 member task force represented diverse backgrounds and they also heard from hundreds of subject matter experts and the general public through listening sessions and written submissions on topics ranging from school discipline to officer shooting investigations to safety and wellness programs. Their final report was released in May of this year with 59 recommendations and hundreds of action steps. To date, my office has distributed thousands of copies of this report, both in print and online. It is available free of charge from our resource center, and I have brought copies with me today for the commissioners if they would like them. The task force formally closed in May after the report was released, but the work to turn those recommendations and action steps into real change in communities continues. In late July, my office, along with the White House, hosted a forum on the final report. More than 150 participants, including representatives of law enforcement, elected officials, and community members from more than 40 cities attended the event. Along with senior administration officials, they discussed and shared strategies for implementing the task force recommendations and developed ideas that both police and community members can use to enhance public safety while building public trust. The discussions at that meeting have helped inform a forthcoming implementation guide that will hopefully help even more communities jumpstart their own <laughs> implementation plans. It was also the starting point for a new section of the task force website where we will be collecting and sharing implementation ideas from around the country on an ongoing basis. For example, in Vail, Colorado, the leadership team rated the police department and the community on a one to five scale about where it stands on each presidential task force recommendation and action item. Team members were also asked to highlight items to focus on by marking them with stars, with the number of stars indicating how many people specified that item become a center of focus. This appreciative inquiry approach has allowed them to turn the task force report into a sophisticated strategic plan and progress tracking me mechanism specific to their police department. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mayor Michael Nutter signed an executive order supporting the efforts of the police department to review the task force report and establish a baseline of current status, recommendations for next steps, and projected costs for implementation. And the police department appointed a captain to be responsible for monitoring department progress on all recommendations and preparing regular reports for, as parts of staff meetings and reports to the city council. The department has also just recently announced that civilian oversight in the form of the police advisory commission will now be a part of the deadly force review process within the police department. The PACS director will have equal standing with the deputy commissioners in deciding whether or not police use of deadly force actions are justified. In Buffalo, New York, the city just announced the BPD 21C initiative, which is a recruitment initiative aimed at ensuring that the next generation of police recruits will model a guardian mentality and represent the diversity of the community they will serve. 
And this summer, Illinois became one of the first states to establish a wide-ranging <coughs> wide law enforcement rules for body cameras, bias-free policing training, and improved data collection on stops and arrests under a law that will take effect in January of 2016. These are but a few of the dozens of stories and examples we are hearing every day. Many more are featured in the implementation guide, and we hope that over the next year, the library of examples highlighted on the website will also prove to be useful examples and guidance to communities everywhere. Both this implementation guide and the task force website are available through our COPS office website starting next week. Of course, most of the task force recommendations were written for state and local agencies to implement, but there were specific recommendations charged to the Department of Justice, and I'll also speak to a few of those today. First, as part of the ongoing efforts of the COPS office to assist the law enforcement field with both current and future challenges, the task force recommended that the office focus on model policing practices and accountability. Our director, Ronald Davis, publicly announced the creation of an initiative to do just that in July of this year. It will work closely with the field to provide comprehensive technical assistance to law enforcement agencies, identify industry best practices and model policies, provide critical response services for communities in crisis, and develop strategies to best implement the task force recommendations at the local level. The creation of this initiative was easy for us in that it is in keeping with our unofficial motto that the COPS office is committed to helping the field advance the field. Second, the COPS office is a grant-making component that provides direct funding to state and local law enforcement agencies. This year, we worked to align many of our grant programs to advancing the task force recommendations. For example, in our hiring program, where we always expect awardees to implement community policing solutions to local problems, this year, we gave additional consideration to applicant agencies that selected building trust as the topical area they plan to address if awarded funds. <coughs> then in our community policing development program, we made a number of awards to organizations looking to enhance the ability of local agencies <coughs> to implement task force recommendations. For example, with an award to Howard University, we hope to help agencies improve diversity in recruitment, hiring, and retention of officers, which speaks directly to a major theme and recommendation of the task force report. Third, we have continued to expand our collaborative reform initiative. This initiative helps agencies ensure their policing practices are constitutionally based and respectful of the community. It is a voluntary program. Agencies have the opportunity to step up and acknowledge their challenges and areas of concern and work with us to proactively address them. It is also a transparent process infused with community input that should help agencies strengthen their policies and improve community engagement. To date, we have engaged in this process in Las Vegas, Spokane, Washington, Philadelphia, St. Louis County, Fayetteville, North Carolina, Salinas, and Calexico, California. Las Vegas has completed this process and has made considerable progress in changing its policies, tactics, and training concerning the use of deadly force. The other sites are at various stages of implementing recommendations or in data collection. But what is particularly important about the Collaborative Reform Initiative is that it doesn't just benefit the agencies involved in it. The detailed reports of findings and recommendations are publicly available, enabling other agencies to use them to guide their own self-reflective reform processes. I brought copies of some of the reports that have already been released, and we expect more agencies to begin the process in the near future, as we have just announced the awarding of a nearly $5 million contract to expand our capacity to do this work. And fourth, along with our colleagues at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Offices of Victims of Crime and Violence Against Women, we have taken up an effort to create a state of policing report. This cross-component work to stand that up starting in 2016 has just begun, but the hope is that the state of policing report will be published annually and serve as a compendium of important issues in the field of policing with the intention of providing resources, discussion points, and areas for further consideration. There's also ongoing work across the Department of Justice that ties into many of the federally focused task force recommendations. The Attorney General even launched a multi-city community policing tour this year to highlight some of the exciting and innovative work that communities and law enforcement are doing together to implement the pillars of the task force and to promote partnership, bolster trust, and improve public safety. Many of you are probably at least somewhat familiar with the Civil Rights Division. It is the division within the department tasked with ensuring local law enforcement agencies police their communities in accordance with the Constitution. It can and does prosecute individual police officers for intentional misconduct, 
but it also prioritizes systemic police reform work. Under a 1994 statute, it has the authority to investigate and, if necessary, sue when it finds a pattern or practice of misconduct, such as unlawful stops, searches and arrests, excessive force, or discriminatory policing. In the past six years, civil rights has opened 22 such investigations of law enforcement agencies and negotiated 19 agreements, most of them court-enforceable, independently monitored consent decrees. The Civil Rights Division is trying to address problems in policing from every angle at its disposal, including disrupting the school-to-prison pipeline by intervening where school discipline practices are overly punitive and disproportionately enforced against students of color, bringing suits around the country to end discrimination in police hiring, and working to ensure that police and court services are available to those with limited English proficiency. The Bureau of Justice Assistance leads a multi-component effort called the Violence Reduction Network, which is taking a comprehensive approach to reduce violent crime in communities around the country. The department's ability to provide intensive training and cutting-edge technical assistance through VRN gives local officials and law enforcement executives in each of the partner communities the support they need to advance anti-violence strategies that do not jeopardize community trust. The Bureau of Justice Statistics is actively looking to improve crime indicators and the collection of data related to the criminal justice system. This is an important discussion that should lead to new and better ways of collecting and sharing data on every aspect of our criminal justice system. It is a truth much acknowledged that what gets measured is what matters. So efforts to instead find better and more timely ways to accurately measure the things we think matter is critical. The Office of Justice Programs houses a diagnostic center, which is a technical assistance resource designed to help city, state, and county, and tribal policymakers and community leaders use data to make decisions about criminal justice programming. Diagnostic center engagements are intended to build community capacity to use data to make short and long-term evidence-based decisions about criminal justice and public safety. But one of their important resources that is currently available to all is a review of what we know about the efficacy of police body-worn cameras aimed at helping communities make informed decisions about implementing a technology that has gained popular support as a tool for ensuring police accountability and was a topic of much discussion at the task force hearings. And just about a year ago, the Department of Justice awarded the National Network for Safe Communities through John Jay College of Criminal Justice a three-year, $4.75 million grant to launch a national initiative for building community trust and justice. This initiative was designed to improve relationships and increase trust between communities and the criminal justice system. It also aims to advance the public and scholarly understanding of issues contributing to those relationships. The national initiative highlights three areas that hold great promise for concrete and rapid progress, namely reconciliation, which facilitates frank conversations between communities and law enforcement that allows them to address historic tensions, grievances, and misconceptions between them and hopefully reset relationships. Procedural justice, which focuses on how the characteristics of law enforcement interactions with the public shape the public's views of the police, their willingness to obey the law, and actual crime rates. An implicit bias, which focuses on how largely unconscious psychological processes can shape authorities' actions and lead to racially disparate outcomes. Of course, these examples only represent a tiny portion of the work across, currently underway across the department. Uh, although I can only speak for myself and my colleagues at the COPS office, I hope that it is clear that across the Department of Justice, there are staff and programs that are committed to protecting individual rights, ensuring officer safety, reducing crime, and working together to make our communities healthy and safe for everyone. At the end of the day, the means of crime control are as important as the ends, and public safety is not just about the absence of crime, it is about the presence of justice. Thank you. Thank you, I now ask Commissioner Gonzalez to U.S. Rapid Chair. Thanks, Madam President, and I, I would like to start by thanking both delegations for their presentations, and especially the, the victims and the relatives who have uh, given our, uh, your testimony here. Um, I think it's a very uh, grave situation that has to be fully addressed, and that's why the Commission is uh, monitoring this on a permanent basis. Um, I would like to make a couple of questions. Um, in the written presentation made by the, by the petitioners of the hearing, they stressed 
that the US, uh, uh, US legal standards do not uh, meet the international standards on this matter. I would like you to elaborate more on this, uh, and I would like to hear from the US government where uh, you consider that the legislation, the domestic legislation, is or not uh, uh, according to um, international standards, because there is a matter of standards, and then there is a matter of actual practices by the by the police. Um, and the other question um, uh, addressed to both parties, to both delegations, is uh, how the, the U.S. government uh, interacts with civil society and victims organizations uh, to work on this issue. Um, perhaps the, the government delegation might explain this and, and the um, petitioners of the hearing may evaluate that, uh, evaluate how the, this has been conducted so far. Thank you very much. Commissioner Ortiz. Voy a hablar en español. I'm going to speak in Spanish if you want to use the translation. <coughs> bueno, un saludo nuevamente. Es la tercera audiencia, ¿no? It's on Channel 7. Channel 7. Un agradecimiento muy especial a los peticionarios, a los familiares de víctimas que ayudan a encarar este problema. También un agradecimiento nuevamente a las autoridades de, de los Estados Unidos. En, entendemos este problema como un problema multifacético y multicausal. Y nos interesaría tomar las palabras de la última representante del Estado que dice lo que se mide es lo que importa como una manera de encarar seriamente el tema y si han identificado esas múltiples causales que hacen al problema en cuanto a los vacíos en el marco legal, en, en el adecuado o inadecuado entrenamiento y la falta de control suficiente la falta de un castigo ejemplar que pudiera frenar la, la impunidad. Y si tienen a los familiares como una contraparte con quienes se podría aprender. Como relatora de derechos de niños y adolescentes y escuchando a los familiares de víctimas, adolescentes, jóvenes, es tan importante el vínculo del adolescente, el joven con las fuerzas del orden Y vemos que a veces la, la policía los ve como criminales simplemente o por el color de la piel o por la forma de vestirse o por la edad que tiene o por el origen étnico. Y eso es, eh, produce un daño muy grande porque el joven, el adolescente está construyendo su identidad y la manera como es visto hace parte de su propia identidad y de su desarrollo eh, personal y social. Por eso pienso que eh, esta asociación de familiares eh, preocupadas por este rompimiento del contrato social pueden contribuir muchísimo para encarar con seriedad los cambios que se requieren para reconstruir ese contrato social indispensable. Visitando a adolescentes privados de libertad, más del 90% son eh, personas afrodescendientes o eh, migrantes latinos. Y tan importante para lo que ocurra aquí en Estados Unidos y el fortalecimiento de esa policía comunitaria con lazos cercanos con la comunidad, que pueda ser a la vez de apoyado, también controlado por la propia comunidad, es establecer ese vínculo con, la, con las personas de la sociedad. Eh, la, el número elevado de personas privadas de libertad y de jóvenes y adolescentes privados de libertad lleva a una crisis, no solamente una crisis en el sistema penitenciario, sino también en la justicia, 
porque los abogados defensores no dan abasto para hacer una defensa caso por caso y actúan muchas veces también con prejuicios o de una manera igual a todos por, por ser afrodescendiente o por ser eh, con, un, con un enfoque discriminativo. Ese es el aporte que yo quería hacer de invitar a que puedan ser más escuchados los familiares de, la, de las víctimas en esta reconstrucción del tejido social. Gracias. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, a, an issue that since the assumption of my mandate four years ago, I've treated as a priority, priority number one, uh, not just policing, but the criminal justice system in entirety in terms of the USA. And it has not always been easy, but finally the dialogue is happening. And I hope when I leave and the commission continues that the dialogue is, becomes even more effective and we begin to see real change. And this, of course, is why we have launched a report on this particular issue of race and the criminal justice system, which is very important for us. Uh, there's no doubt that, and I believe we have both sides have acknowledged that there is structural racism in terms of policing and the criminal justice system. And that is evident in racial profiling and the failure of the state and to meaningfully investigate and prosecute uh, victims. And I want to formally acknowledge the presence of the families of the victim, victims yourselves here. When I started, I didn't know that you were going to be speaking. And we have had other families here, and we really welcome your input. Uh, and I think even the non-believers today can no longer pretend or ignore the subject. So that is a good thing. That in itself, I think, is progress. Uh, so there's been greater visibility brought to the issue. And I think perhaps mainly because of technology. A lot of what we are seeing happening, the, the videos and so on. But still, uh, even though we are seeing the evidence, the lay person on the street, we still have the problem of the lack of prosecution prosecution and effective investigation. So the system continues to fail us. I think uh, in terms of the visit that you heard that I carried out uh, last month, one of, that was one of the most disturbing facts and the disturbing pieces of information. And I heard lots of good reports of things that are happening, and we want to acknowledge that they are happening. Better training, efforts at training the police, cameras, body cameras, as we mentioned here today. These are all good things we heard of community policing. But one startling statistic is that all of the visits that we made, and we actually visited the police departments and so on, and had, had dialogue with the chief of police, we, wouldn't, we would, were not able to find one single instance of a conviction. So when I get that, when I get evidence that it exists, I think that would be good, but we haven't found any. So that is a really startling statistic. Uh, and I think that must be the single most important thing that the US must do in order to really address and begin to address this issue is to begin to prosecute seriously, investigate and prosecute seriously to stop what I think is really a cover up in terms of the police. So then, only then maybe we begin to reverse some of what is really a shameful legacy and we all acknowledge it's very difficult and complex. I wanted to mention um, also something that uh, came out of that too and I think you began to hint at it uh, the state in his presentation, and that is the need, and many people we spoke to, this was hammered home, the need to have independent investigations uh, in terms of the police. I think we need to bring that at the federal, at the federal level now. Uh, in many countries, that's the direction we've gone. 
uh, even apart from the issue of race, it's always difficult to, to prosecute uh, the police. So many countries have gone in that direction of fully independent uh, investigations. And you mentioned individualized data, which is, I think, a very important component as well, which we I didn't think we had sight of. So thank you for that input. I would like to know whether there are any plans, any serious plans for law reform in this area at the federal level. Another thing that I learned in my visit, which wasn't mentioned here, but I think it's important to mention, the way in which in some states, for example in Missouri, the way in which uh, the system was structured in such a way, and you asked whether it's deliberate, and whether the system is, where the system is structured in such a way in, in that it targets uh, poor, uh, black persons in terms of a, a conscious attempt to finance the law enforcement wheel. So that for instance, they would arrest persons and ticket them for offenses, and that money goes to financing the police and financing the courts. This was something that we thought was, was very strange to us. And what that does, where there's a context of race discrimination, as we know exists, and where there's racial profiling already happening, is to start, it be an incentive to, to arrest um, uh, persons. And so we, it's a vicious cycle. And the persons are arrested for simple offenses, re-arrested because they can't pay the fine, criminalized, and then the cycle goes on. And that, I think, is another very concrete step that uh, the state can do, and you asked about wanting justice now, wanting change now. There are some structural mechanisms like that. That's another concrete step. Do we have plans to abolish that kind of regime, institutionalized uh, racist practices <coughs> that can go a long way, at least in some states? So those are my comments for now. A very difficult issue, I think, is evident to everybody. Again, I want to thank all of us for airing it. I now give three minutes each to make any further responses to the questions or comments. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to respond to Commissioner Gonzalez's questions in regards to international law. Um, so the U.S. standard on lethal force um, violates international human rights standards in the sense that it fails to establish that officers must exhaust non-lethal options before resorting to the use of deadly force in the enforcement of the law. So Amnesty International has shown that nine states actually have no laws whatsoever on the use of force. And no state law prohibits the use of force except as a last resort. So there's no state that adheres to those international human rights standards at all out of the 50 states. Um, and so that, that right there shows that the constitutional standard is in clear violation of the international standard as well, because none of those states are violating the Constitution, apparently, um, and their failure to create these laws around lethal force that's, uh, that adhere to international standards. And uh, just really briefly, I just wanted to respond that the report on 21st century policing um, that uh, the government uh, went into such detail about. We're also going to be filing a detailed analysis that shows the areas where that report in and of itself is insufficient. So for example, the, the idea of community policing, the fourth pillar of the report, um, focuses on community policing as a real possible solution. But community policing also includes stop and frisk policing, it also includes broken windows policing, um, other quality of life policing measures that um, rely on enforcement of petty crimes and this idea that if you enforce petty crimes, then you'll be able to um, create a community where everyone feels that the quality of life is higher and therefore less crime. So that has been debunked. That, that approach has been debunked. What it actually does is create this environment of mass incarceration. Um, so in the United States, you see that there are over 4,000 prisoners for every 100,000 um, African-American men in the United States, and about 600 um, prisoners for every 100,000 white men in the United States. So it's a, it's a huge problem. Community policing will only exacerbate that problem. And then, to be honest, body cameras themselves also, um, we are concerned that that could exacer exacerbate the mass incarceration problem even further, because what we've seen so far is that uh, police very rarely either turn on or properly uh, make public 
body camera footage that harms their version of the story or that goes against their version of the story. What they do use the body camera footage for is convictions, to gather evidence against people who may be committing these petty crimes of jaywalking or what have you. And so these, these uh, video pieces of evidence, police unions have fought to keep those pieces of evidence from going public. Um, but they've also fought for the right to be able to use those pieces of evidence as an offense against um, people who they think they want to convict of crimes. So we feel that both the body camera and the community policing aspects of the 21st Century Task Force report are actually harming the, the situation as opposed to helping it. So I think both Commissioner Gonzalez and I asked about law reform, but you may want to give us your thoughts in writing. It doesn't have to be now. Uh, uh, we'd appreciate any sort of written information if you don't have specific answers now uh, in relation to that. And similarly, we are always anxious and eager to receive written information in addition to what was said today. So if you don't have any further comments. So once again, let me thank all of you and the state for attending uh, in the spirit of collaboration, cooperation, and good faith. And we note the will to improve, and we wait in hope for things to progress. We've all acknowledged they haven't gone anywhere near where they should be. And I want to thank again uh, all of you who came here today to present on this really very important issue to highlight, not just for us, but for the state and for a very wide audience. Thank you again. <laughs>